Joining us right now, our friend from ESPN, um, and just to get his thoughts before we take your phone calls, and then the NBCSN uh, show begins with Peter King, Joel Klatt, and Pat McAfee. Bill Barnwell back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Bill? Hey, guys. How's it going? I'm fine. The headline of last night, you have the floor. What do you got for me? What do you think? I, I think it's the Justin Love trade, right? Or Sorry, yeah, the uh, Jordan, Jordan Love, Love trade. Excuse me. I was yep. Justin Herbert from Jordan Love's first name's confused. Uh, it's the Jordan Love trade because everything else kind of went – we we expected like there's a lot of logic no crazy trades i think the jordan love trade mm. and what it means for aaron Rodgers' future in green bay mm. is the most interesting thing coming out of, of day one of the draft I, I can't wait to unless you know the answer um i'll ask you before peter king did uh, um who called aaron somebody had to call him last night is it good <laughs> Yeah, you got to figure, right? I mean, you have to hope that somebody called Aaron Rodgers, at least hopefully that they heard about it at least a couple minutes before the pick was actually made. But, I mean, you know, Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers. And at the end of the day, whether you told him in advance, whether you called him, whether you didn't call him, you have to figure he's not going to be happy about this. Well, again, um, he's he's not concerned for his job right now at all. And I'm sure he's not concerned for his job, period, because if the Packers do – want to move on from a 38-year-old Aaron Rodgers. There uh, was a market for people that age in Phillip Rivers, okay? Mm -hmm. And I would proffer to say Rodgers will be much more physically um, fit and prone and than, than, than uh, Phillip. Somebody will take mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers at age 38. So it, 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 his career is not in jeopardy. It's, it's just... He's been waiting since 2011 to get a first-round pick on the offensive side of the ball, and they finally give one, and it's right after he worked whatever magic he was able to work to get this team into a position to compete for the conference championship, mm -hmm. and they draft somebody that does not give them, in the first for the first-round pick, a better shot at winning next year's NFC, this year's NFC championship at all. I don't know. Here's what I would say. Think about Aaron Rodgers' recent past, right? This is a guy where we know he has injury issues. A couple of years ago, it really sank their season, losing Aaron Rodgers for six or eight weeks. If you have Jordan Love, in the, in the long term, obviously, you're, you're molding him to be your quarterback of the future. There's plenty of time for that. It's two years before the Packers can realistically, for cap reasons, move on from Aaron Rodgers. But that does give you a guy, in case Rodgers gets hurt, who fills in. Now, do you need to use a first-round pick to get that guy? No. But I do think it helps a little bit in the short term and then this is a draft that we know is incredibly deep with wide receiver talent even after uh how many guys five six have taken in, in the first round yesterday so the packers can still get a receiver at at 62 if you want to take the, the third to last pick of the second round they can still get a guy who should be able to help that offense in in 2020 now is it going to be as good as someone you know like a uh like a Justin Jefferson or a Brandon Ayuk? No, but those guys weren't on the board. So maybe if the Packers said, hey, we were going to take a whiteout, but once we kind of had our guys get off the board, that next tier of whiteout is a guy we think we can get in the second round. Yeah. I, <laughs> yes. And I, I said minutes ago that they, they can absolutely come away at the end of the night with starters that can significantly contribute this fall. But it's just, again, the, the message – that that's been and even though I know Gutekunst and and the rest of the crew this is a lot of what Ted Thompson was doing for years mm -hmm. uh it, it's just all builds up it all builds up and and I I really would love to get his inner thoughts at some point he, he will be in front of a microphone and we will find out but okay so outside of that give me a give me a pick that you thought that's chef's kiss what a what a great uh, opportunity for this team and this kid from where uh they were able to draft him can I give you one that I think kind of went underneath the radar Go, a little bit? Please. I, I I really like Jerry Judy to the Broncos at 15. And they know, hey, True Lock is not a guy who I think we have a lot of confidence in as a franchise quarterback for both those guys. So I think with, with, with Jerry Judy coming in, he doesn't have to be the top guy because Cameron Sutton is an awesome uh, football player. You have uh, the you Noah know, fan coming in for second year. Usually your tight ends get that second year boost. Melvin Gordon's going to play a role in the passing game. This guy's going to get one-on-one coverage every single time he's on the football field. And I think he's a guy who can beat 
one-on-one coverage. And for Drew Locke, I mean, this is great. You have all these weapons for a guy who we don't know anything about at this point, five starts so far. You know, we're going to get to know pretty quick whether he's the guy or not because there's nothing he could ask for. He has a great uh, pass-catching running back. He has a great pair of wide receivers. He has a very promising tight end. He has the weapons that usually it takes a quarterback two or three years to kind of amass. So I I think it's just an interesting fit. And I think a guy who, you know, is going to be in a better opportunity to succeed than it might seem right now given his quarterback situation. What do you think of the Raiders having their choice of all receivers and they go rugs? I mean, I appreciate the homage to Al Davis. Yes. I, I think it's an exciting thing. I just I didn't get it because you have Tyrell Williams. So granted, Tyrell Williams might not be under contract uh, for very long, but you have a guy who is a downfield threat already. You kind of want that intermediate guy, the guy who was going to be the Antonio Brown for that offense. And, you know, Henry Ruggs, I think, is a, a very promising receiver, but he's not really that guy. So, you know, I, I, I look at that offense. I look at what, what uh, Derek Carr as well. He's typically not a guy who wants to throw the ball downfield that much. He wants to get the ball out of his hands quickly. He wants to, you know, uh, get the ball out accurately, and he's very good at that. So, um, you know, I, I think the talent's there, but I, I question the fit in that offense, unless the offensive scheme and, hey, the quarterback also possibly changes. Oh, gosh. So uh, what about the Giants and Andrew Thomas being the first tackle taken on the board? I think we heard a lot about Andrew Thomas over the course uh, of this draft period. I mean, I think every team had their own personal preference in terms of which tackle they wanted. Uh, but Andrew Thomas, I think when he, you know, read mock drafts and talked to people in the league, there were a lot of people who thought he was the best tackle in the NFL. And I think for the Giants, it's a really good opportunity because not only can you have him start on the right side, but he's a guy who I think a lot of people thought could be a left tackle in the long run. So now Nate Solder's future with the team is uncertain. He has been pretty disappointing his first two seasons with the Giants. He could be cut this offseason as a post-June 1st release. They could wait until next year, give him one more season. But I think Thomas is a guy where you, you feel pretty confident he can play both tackle spots, which, uh, you know, maybe not maybe would not have been the case for every single one of these top four tackles. So uh, I think the Giants are, are doing the right stuff to support their offensive infrastructure and, and support Daniel Jones. And I think at the end of the day, if you, you think he's your guy, keep you know, stay at four, pick your guy, get your tackle, and then hope he can be a left tackle in the future. Bill Barnwell here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, the Browns have to be happy with Jedrick Wills, right? I mean, and then the, uh, the Cardinals getting Isaiah Simmons. That is just going to be a fun, fun ad to put on on a level before Patrick Peterson, right? And behind mm-hmm. Chandler Jones, what a what a what a beautiful piece that is for for Arizona. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, yeah. Could you imagine heading into this off season, you would tell a Cardinals fan you're going to get Isaiah Simmons and DeAndre Hopkins. <laughs> I mean, you know that they they would have they would have been as happy as Cliff Kingsbury looked in his palatial estate in Arizona last night. Uh, if you told them that before the off season, I think that's an awesome, awesome fit for that team, given what they need. Every, every fantasy football player, every daily fantasy football player has spent the last two years starting tight ends against the Cardinals, no matter how bad they are. Ross Dwelly had a monster game against the Cardinals in fantasy football last year. So to get a guy who, uh, you know, and I say Simmons who can guard tight ends, who can play safety, who can play linebacker, such an exciting fit. And then the Browns, I mean, everything they did this offseason tells me, hey, we're going to evaluate Baker Mayfield. We're going to know by the end of the year whether he is our guy or not. You get Jedrick Wilson to play one tackle spot, Jack Conklin to play the other tackle spot. You had Austin Cooper. I mean, Baker Mayfield is everything a quarterback could want. So true. at this point, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, 2020 or bust for Baker Mayfield in terms of evaluating what his future looks like as Brown's quarterback. Yeah, new coach, right? Um, mm-hmm. Odell, um, if he wasn't traded by last night, he's not going anywhere. No. And then, you know, Jarvis Landry, uh, he comes back healthy from his surgery. You just mentioned, um, you know, Njoku is going to be um, part of the two tight end, one would believe, yep. right? Uh, Kareem mm-hmm. Hunt, Nick Chubb coming off of an incredible season. You just got the offensive line shored, shored up a little bit. The defense hasn't really lost appreciably very much. Um that's it. This is it, right, for Baker. We're, the, 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 let's put it this way. The Browns are better set up to evaluate Baker than the Jets are, even though they got Becton last night with Sam Darnold, wouldn't you think? Of course they are. I mean, they did more during the offseason to add talent to their roster. The Jets added a lot of depth. There's a lot of, you know, they added some pretty mediocre offensive linemen. I like the Rashad Perriman signing, but he's a second, third wideout realistically. I mean, there's still a, a team that needs a number one wideout that needs a – uh, a tight end who's effective and consistently available to play, which has not been the case. 
Um, and, and with Bakai Becton, I think he's an awfully talented player. I mean, I loved his dad. His dad was one of the stars of the draft for me. Uh, but a guy who I think is still, you know, you have to keep him in shape. And, and I think they can do that. I think he's someone who's, you know, was motivated and, and played well in college and, and has great footwork, obviously had that great 40. But, um, you know, this is a Jets team that has really struggled to develop offensive linemen over the past decade or so, since that's the Brickershaw Ferguson, uh, Nick Mangold class. So can they develop Beckton into a top-tier left tackle? I and mean, can he be that guy from day one? Because that's what Sam Darnold needs at this point. Bill Barnwell, a few more minutes left with ESPN senior writer and the host of the Bill Barnwell Show podcast right here on the Rich Eisen Show. What did you make of the Eagles' evaluation at the wide receiver position? They don't go Justin Jefferson. They don't go Ayuk. They go Jalen Rager from TCU. What do you think of that move? Yeah, he kind of seems like he's going to be the replacement for Deshaun Jackson in 2021 and kind of the insurance policy if Deshaun Jackson is not – 100% for a chunk of time in 2020, which we know is a possibility. They really needed to add speed. Uh, You know, it makes sense they focus on that. I think it speaks to the reality that they still have some faith in a J.J. Ortega-Whiteside and Alshon Jeffrey because it seemed like Ortega-Whiteside was going to be the long-term replacement for Jeffrey. We know Jeffrey's not 100%. Ortega-Whiteside really struggled last year. So, you know, I I think it does make sense given what they needed in the short term and sort of how they want to configure that roster long term as, you know, your Carson Wentz's uh, and your other players from their, their previous draft classes get more expensive. They have to kind of get cheap somewhere. And so I think wide receiver with Ortega Whiteside and with uh, uh, Rager are going to be the two spots where they're willing to get those kind of rookie receivers playing meaningful roles uh, as recently, or sorry, as soon as 2021. And the Vikings use the pick they, they got uh, in sending away Stephon Diggs for Justin Jefferson. They've got to be ecstatic ecstatic over that you have to be thrilled right if, if you if you could make that trade you know on that day for the vikings and know hey we're going to get Justin jefferson without having to trade up i think that's an absolute victory for what the vikings would have wanted you come into this draft you kind of figure they're going to go wide receiver and cornerback just because they need a wide out and mike zimmer takes cornerbacks in years where his cornerback depth chart is full let alone when it's pretty empty as it is right now so you know getting jeff gladney uh getting justin jefferson i think is exactly what they would have hoped for heading into the draft and i think justin jefferson can be an impact player from day one they're not going to throw the ball a ton i think they want to be a run first team mike zimmer's always said that and i think they're going to run the ball a little more frequently than they have in years past but I think Justin Jefferson is such a great player that, you know, he can make an impact if he's playing 20, 25 snaps per game. Right. And uh, and then uh, I'll ask the question some Chargers fans are probably thinking about. It. Was it worth uh, trading back into the first round to get Kenneth Murray? Is he that good? I mean, he's a great football player. But at the end of the day, you look at history, those trades just don't work. I mean, time after time after time, when you trade into the first round, give up a two and a three, for a player who's not a quarterback or a guy who's not at a a critical position, those moves, not always, but almost always, tend to be disappointing. I, I think it's a great player, but look at the Patriots. The Patriots could very viably have said, hey, we need an inside linebacker. We just lost Cal Van Noy. We just lost Jamie Collins. Those guys are you know, inside-outside guys. They can play a bit of both, but so can Kenneth Murray. Let's take Kenneth Murray. Bill Belichick says, no, let's move down. Let's get a second, third-round pick. We can find a guy who's pretty useful in the second round and the third round. And for however good Kenneth Murray is, this Chargers team now has a major, major hole at left tackle for Justin Herbert or Tyrod Taylor. And without those second and third round picks, no obvious way to fill it. Mm, that is significant. That's an interesting one. And um, the choice of Clyde edwards Alaire over any other running back that the Chiefs made. What would you think of that? Okay. So I, I like it. Here's what it reminds me of. Remember in, in was 2000, it was 2000, I think, the Rams took Trunk Candidate in the first round when they oh, had Marshall Falk. Yes. And... You know, it, it didn't really work out, but it was such an exciting idea. So they, they, okay, let's get, you know, another weapon for our offense. Let's keep building this offensive core, and we can make this work, and he can be another threat for us. I mean, the Chiefs have been able to get by with, you know, guys off the street, uh, mediocre running backs. Pretty much on a mediocre running back, but a third-round pick. They have not really invested this much in a running back during the Andy Reid era. So, you know, I think he's going to be a guy who rotates in with Damian Williams over the course of his rookie season. Um, but I think a guy who just – who do you cover at the end of the day, right? You know, I mean, this is this is the best screen team in football, the Chiefs. Now you have uh, Edwards Hilaire on those screen passes where he can be such a dangerous threat. Um, you have him as a guy who can beat linebackers and safeties one-on-one when they're in man coverage. It's just there's so many ways for Patrick Mahomes to find guys. And this is going to make his life easier. 
he's going to be able to dump the ball off more frequently to a, to a running back knowing, hey, this guy can make people miss one-on-one. -on -one. He can make big plays after the catch with his feet. And the Chiefs, I mean, Hunt was that guy, but Damian Williams was not really that guy. So I think it's a really exciting opportunity. I don't love taking a running back in the first round, but I think the Chiefs are just a, a deep team, it's such a talented team, that I can not really fault them for this particular choice. So who uh, is best available tonight, sir, as we start focusing on rounds two and three, night two? What do you got for me? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're looking at the safeties. I think Xavier McKinney uh, and Antoine Winfield Jr., I think two guys who, you know, I think were expected to go in the first round, especially uh, McKinney. I think the Giants are a team that really needs safety help. I mean, safety's just been a mess for them for so many years. So good to see them going for one of those two guys. The Patriots want to supplement that secondary. Good to see them going for one of those guys as well. Um, Trevon Diggs, corner, who I think was, you know, in a lot of places, expected to be a first-round pick. And then J.K. Dobbins. I, I want to see where he goes. Could he be a pick for the Dolphins, perhaps, at 39 to you know, sort of learn behind Jordan Howard and then be their feature back from, uh, you know, year two on it? I know he's a guy who, uh, Rich, you're a big fan of, so I'm hoping he's going to land at a spot that I think you can watch him play for years to come. So um, the quarterbacks that are going to go off the board next and uh, your best guess as to which team takes them would be which, Bill? Good question. I only um, ask those. I like to think. <laughs> Next quarterback off the board. I mean, Jacob Eason, maybe. You know, I, I think that uh, there's going to be a team that really likes his size, his arm strength. I mean, hey, the Patriots do have that extra pick now. Would it be shocking or out of the question at 37 for them to go out uh, and draft that guy? Look at the Jaguars maybe as a team that could be in, in the running for an Eason, perhaps. I mean, they added two defensive pieces, so they could look towards the offense. Um, Hurts. No, I think those are the yeah the Colts. What about uh, as well? I think. What about Hurts? Jalen Hurts. What about Jalen Hurts? You know, I, I think there's an interesting fit there. I think it's going to have to be the right team. You know, like the three was with Lamar Jackson. Like that was the perfect fit in a team that really invested in Lamar Jackson in terms of their infrastructure and in terms of their coaching staff. So with Jalen Hurts, I mean, would the Ravens even consider? drafting Jalen Hurts and having him be a backup to Lamar Jackson and a guy who can play a few snaps per game in, in a similar sort of role. Um, the hmm. Steelers, a team that comes to mind for me, is a team that needs a quarterback, a team that's been very versatile in years past and very comfortable with different ideas of what a backup quarterback or another quarterback could be, and Michael Dick, or even going back to Cordell Stewart. So uh, they could be a team for me that needs a quarterback to back up Ben Roethlisberger at 49. Bill, I knew you'd be the perfect guest to have on the day after first up, a day after the first round. I appreciate it. Maybe we'll get you back on early next week. We'll we'll talk about the draft uh, fully, all seven that, rounds. That pleasure, sir. Anytime. Really appreciate it. That is uh, Bill Barnwell. Check him out. Follow him on Twitter at Bill Barnwell and follow him. Uh, whatever. I mean, that guy knows everything. That guy knows everything. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.